Welcome to the RV Industry Association and our presentation of the changes to the NFPA 1192 for the 2021 code cycle. I'm Mick Sass, Senior Inspector for the Association. We have several changes and clarifications to review for the 1192 for 2021, and this presentation should run about an hour. Here are a couple of dates to remember in regards to the 2021 code cycle enforcement. As of January 1st, 2021, inspectors will be citing the changes found in this presentation as advisory deviations. They will be recorded in the comments section of the inspection report, including the exact language and the code number references. The second date to keep in mind is July 1st of next year. At this point, all new code positions will be fully enforced and cited on the inspection reports. This information and much more can always be found at our website. The standard news bulletins are found under Standards and Regulations, then go to Standards Compliance, and then finally to Standard News Bulletins. Okay, getting started. Uh, under 2-1, we are going to mention that we have two new power sources that are being added to the low volt standard. We are all familiar with battery systems, both for the chassis and the house. We are familiar with converters and inverter chargers. And we are also familiar with the charge line from our tow vehicles, as well as other power sources that are listed under 2-1. The first new power source being added, we all know well, solar panels. These can be permanently mounted or portable units that are set up once you are at the camping location. The second and much more obscure power source is the fuel cell. To date, I have yet to see a fuel cell installed in a production line RV. Fuel cells work like batteries, but they do not run down or need recharging. They produce electricity and heat as long as fuel is supplied. A fuel cell consists of two electrodes, a negative electrode, or anode, and a positive electrode, the cathode, sandwiched around an electrolyte. We may not see them yet, but we're sure that the day will come so in anticipation fuel cells have been added to the list of power sources in the 12 volt standard. All right, 2-3, and this is on non-vented battery installations. First, non-vented batteries need to be listed. However, a specific standard has not been chosen as this technology continues to develop. So any listing provided for the battery would need to be a listing agency that is on the RVIA recognized list of acceptable listing agencies. Installation instructions should be provided by the battery manufacturer or supplier and they need to be followed. Often, these instructions will dictate that batteries installed outside the RV need to be placed in an enclosure, a housing, or a hood. This is typically to protect the battery and its connections. Now, if the battery installation instructions do not address installing inside the RV, it will be required that the battery terminals be protected from unintended contact with goods or other components. This would permit shelves or other such protection to be added to protect the battery from that physical damage. The following warning label also needs to be affixed in multiple locations as follows. First, one needs to be affixed to the RV adjacent to the non-vented battery in a location that remains visible after the battery's installation. Secondly, a label needs to be affixed to the battery where an enclosure is not provided, or to the exterior and interior of an enclosure when it is provided. 
And finally, lithium batteries are required to be listed, which does address thermal runaway. They are also required to have a management or a protective system to provide safety for situations of high or low voltage, high and low temperature, and for limiting high current output, as well as for cell balancing. All right, let's take a look at the requirements for solar preps. Most of this is common sense, as you would expect, and there's really no departure from the normal installation of 12 volt components. The first requirement is based on following long established requirements. Since there will be a wide variety of configurations when solar power is installed or in a prep form, it must be remembered that the solar panel installations are part of the low voltage system. As such, they need to comply with all applicable requirements of the low volt standard. As seen with these deviations from the low volt standard and our RVIA deviation database, these codes related deviations are well known in the RV manufacturing facilities. These and other deviations under the same code references are to be considered when installing a solar power system. So the best way to look at the first requirement of 2-6 is that all solar preps must follow the applicable requirements of the low volt standard. The second requirement states that if you install the solar controller, it must be installed as required by the manufacturer's installation instructions. This requirement goes along with the installation of most devices on an RV, that they must be installed as the manufacturer of the device intended. Installing them in a location other than where the manufacturer's installation instructions require can void the warranty and potentially create a dangerous situation for the occupants of the RV. The third requirement. This specific requirement states that either end of the conductors involved in the solar prep be capped so there are no exposed ends of the conductor. When a solar prep is installed in an RV, the conductor ends must be capped with no exposed strands. This is an example of what would be considered an exposed end or exposed copper conductors. The use of junction boxes will still require that the individual conductors be capped within the J-box. Solar preps will vary in how the conductors are installed, but the bottom line is that the conductors must be capped and labeled at either end of their run when necessary. The next requirement, number four, is that conductors are retained within the identified controller location. What does this mean? This requirement means that securement must be provided for the conductors at the specified controller location if the controller is not installed as part of the solar prep. Conductors are not to be loose within the cabinet or other storage location intended for the controller's installation. Number five. Now we are going to look at the labeling of conductors involved in the solar preps. The controller shown here is highlighting the positive and negative connections to the battery bank. However, on a simple solar prep installation, the controller may not be part of the prep. In that case, only conductors may run from the installed roof connection back to a junction box where the controller will be installed sometime in the future. In that case, and at that junction box, labeling will be necessary. At this location on the controller, if installed as part of the solar prep, the battery connections are labeled with a battery icon displaying both the positive and the negative designations. So additional labels for battery plus and battery negative will not be needed if the controller is clearly marked as seen here and installed as part of the solar prep. If only a junction box is provided or conductors simply secured to the future controller's location, then the positive and the negative labels must be attached to either the conductors themselves or to labels adjacent to the respective conductors. 
Here, the controller clearly designates the positive and the negative pressure connectors that would be acceptable labeling if installed as part of the solar prep. So the sixth requirement also deals with more labeling. Again, this labeling requirement will vary from system to system based on the overall design configurations. These labels may be attached to the appropriate ends of the conductors at each terminal of the battery or battery bank connections. They also may be attached adjacent to the connection terminals of the battery bank, enclosure, or compartment. The seventh requirement, again, is a labeling requirement. This is for the solar power input at the controller. Here again, we see a solar panel controller with a solar panel icon and a positive and negative indication on the controller itself. This would be appropriate if the controller is installed with conductors all the way to the roof connection terminal. However, if only wires are supplied from the roof connection or other connection location, such as a sidewall mounted solar panel connection for mobile solar panels, then the labeling at the solar controller's location must be supplied. If a roof connection terminal, as seen here, is provided for a future solar panel, the other end of the solar prep conductor seen here would run back to a controller as mentioned in the previous slide or to a junction box or a set of secured wires at the future solar controller location. So at this point, if a controller is not provided, an additional label will be needed on each of the conductors, identifying them as positive or negative leads respectively with a PV plus label or a PV minus label. In summary of 2-6, Simply remember that all applicable low volt standards apply to any solar powered supply system, as they would with any other 12 volt equipment or material. Then apply all requirements to 2-6 listed here for a properly installed solar prep system. Okay, on to 3-1. This is an exception to 3-1 along with braking circuits, cranking circuits, and circuits supplying FMVSS required lighting. Solar panel circuits are considered current limiting. Therefore, overcurrent protection is not required of these circuits, providing the conductors have sufficient ampacity for the largest available current from the solar panels. To date, and in my experience, supply conductors leading from the solar panels to their controllers have always been a 10 gauge stranded wire. Stranded because it's a current carrying and it's in the low voltage system, a specific requirement for the low volt standard under 4-1. The use of 10 gauge conductors is not necessarily the largest conductor that could be utilized, but it is the primary conductor used for this purpose at this time. When evaluating the installation of any solar panel and its associated components, always refer to the manufacturer's installation instructions to assure that the proper conductor size is installed. This should also be based on the maximum current the solar panels can produce in conjunction with the ampacity rating for the stranded conductor to be installed, normally a 10 gauge stranded conductor. 5-3.3. Now, conductors in the 12 volt system need to be supported and secured at intervals not exceeding four and a half feet or 54 inches. This support and securement can be provided by passing through studs or by the use of staples, clamps, or other similar means. Conductors just laying on the floor or in ceiling spaces or other horizontal surfaces will be supported but not considered secured. This will be true even in ceiling spaces after insulation has been installed. So, 
simply requires support and securement of all 12 volt wiring every four and a half feet or 54 inches throughout the entire length of each circuit. This now basically mirrors the requirements of support and securement in the 120 volt system under 551.47i. All right, eyelet and spade terminals, 6-1.12. Eyelets, captive spade terminals, lock washers or star washers shall all be the same nominal size as the stud or attachment case they are attached to. As seen with the automotive circuit breaker on the left of this photograph, the stud size is much too small for the eyelet terminal it is attached to. Also note that the star styled lock washer is appropriately sized for the stud and the nut as it should be. This clearly illustrates that the eyelet terminal inside diameter is incorrect for this application. The same is true for the stud on the far left of the same circuit breaker, except that the eyelet terminal has been centered on the stud. Even though centered, the lock washer and nut do not have a full contact with the eyelet terminal's inside diameter and is not providing a positive securement. However, on the automotive circuit breaker on the right, we see the correct use of stud, lock washer, and nut along with the proper sized eyelet terminal. All are the correct nominal size components to make this a very secure low voltage connection. Now on to a new requirement under 55140D reverse polarity indicators. A reverse polarity indicating device that provides a continuous visible or audible signal shall be installed within the 120 volt system of a recreational vehicle in accordance with its installation instructions and shall respond to the reversal of ungrounded and the grounded conductor in the 120 volt AC system. This is the exact language out of the NEC. Now in this photograph, we see a power cord that has two indicating lights on it on the male portion of the power cord. A green light will indicate that the polarity is correct and the power supply is safe to use. A red light will indicate that the polarity of the campground power is incorrect. In this photograph, we see three devices that provide the continuous audible or visual signals required by 55140D. These devices, however, are not acceptable as they are not a permanent component of the 120 volt system and could be removed or not installed at all when hooking up the RV to the park power post. The bottom line for this new requirement under 55140D is that the device providing this continuous indication of reverse polarity must be an integrated component of the 120 volt system. This means that it could be part of a transfer switch or integrated into a distribution panel board, or as we saw with the power cord, with a LED light indicating the correct or incorrect polarity. So this is a change in the code as it relates to traffic areas in the kitchen. In the past, receptacles that were within six feet of a sink, but were on the opposite side of a walkway or a traffic area, were exempt from being GFCI protected. The measurement, as always, is taken from the receptacle to the edge of the sink as seen in this illustration. With the introduction of islands in RV kitchens, that has changed to some degree. Let me explain. First, microwave and microwave preps. Receptacles for microwaves or microwave preps will not be required to be on a GFCI as long as a convenience GFCI receptacle is provided to service the countertop in the kitchen sink area. In this case, the required GFCI recept is seen here and is labeled B. 
The receptacle labeled C, which is in the cabinet of the microwave, would not need to be GFCI for that reason. The counter space already has a GFCI protected outlet. Secondly, since the microwave itself would block the outlet, a GFCI protection is not required. If the outlet is located in a separate side of the cabinet from where the microwave is located and has a cabinet door, it is not considered a convenient outlet because it is not conveniently located for everyday use. So summing up the microwave outlet requirements, these receptacles either used or intended for future microwave installations will not require GFCI protection as long as a GFCI outlet is installed to service the countertop where the microwave is located. Or they are in a cabinet and hidden by the microwave. Or they would be hidden once the microwave is installed or are inside a cabinet with a door adjacent to the microwave compartment. Also remember, these microwave recepts can be double yoked. Okay, other dedicated appliances. Now, in this scenario, or others like it, receptacles for other appliances such as TVs and coffee makers will not be required to be GFCI protected when within six feet of a kitchen sink only if the receptacle is rendered inaccessible by the installed appliance. If you choose to place a receptacle at the TV cabinet location and a TV or other appliance is not installed, leaving the receptacle accessible, then it would need to be GFCI protected. So what is inaccessible? To be considered inaccessible will mean that the receptacle is located inside a cabinet with a door or hidden by the TV or appliance itself. In this scenario, we have a receptacle within six feet of the sink basin and it is installed above the dinette table. Now for that reason, this outlet will not need to be GFCI protected as the dinette table is not considered a countertop for the kitchen. In this kitchen configuration, we have receptacles within six feet of the sink basin and one that is installed on the opposing wall within six feet and across two walkways. For that reason, and as mentioned earlier, it is not installed to serve a countertop surface. So this outlet on the far wall beside the dinette will not need to be GFCI protected. However, when we look at this standalone kitchen island, this type of configuration is where the code clarification comes into play. In either configuration that have a sink or cooktop, or are simply islands with countertop workspace, both would require one or more GSCI protected outlets as seen here. The island is within six feet of a sink as it would be in most kitchen configurations. So with or without the cooktop as seen here, and even though it is surrounded by walkways on all sides, GSCI protected outlets would be necessary because the island's countertop has usable workspace. Now, one more caveat to this area and those that are similar to it. Take the scenario with this small countertop next to the door beside the TV cabinet and that it is less than 12 inches by 12 inches. Here, the receptacle would be optional. If you choose to place receptacle at this location, it will need to be GFCI protected. Thus, both receptacles A and E, if accessible and not hidden behind a door, would need to be GFCI protected even though they cross a walkway. This is simply the same as the receptacles installed in the kitchen island. All have outlets within six feet of the sink basin and all cross walkways.
All right, on to washers and dryers in a bathroom area. All receptacles now for washer and dryers located in a bathroom area are required to be GFCI protected. This is true for the photograph seen here. This area has two pocket doors, one on either side to close off this hallway and make this area a bathroom. So in any bathroom area, the receptacles for a washer dryer, whether located in a dedicated space such as this closet or in an alcove, must be GFCI protected. And again, this is true even if the receptacles are located behind the washer and dryer and out of sight. They still must be GFCI protected. Also, if the dedicated space in a bathroom area only houses a small combination washer dryer or is intended for a washer dryer prep, as seen here on the right, they will also need to be GFCI protected. But say the washer dryer is located in a closet or an alcove that is not in a bathroom area, such as in a bedroom, then the washer dryer receptacles will not need to be GFCI protected. Okay, on to uh, GFCIs in uh, special transportation areas. As we all know, there are two main types of RVs with special transportation areas. Those that have an open floor plan with the living area and the vehicle storage areas combined. And there are those RVs with special transportation areas that have a wall of separation. A special transportation area of an RV designed to transport internal combustion engine vehicles must have at least one receptacle installed. Additional receptacles are optional. If the transportation area is separated from the living area by a wall of separation, all receptacles in the special transportation area must have GFCI protection per 551.41 C5. The open floor plan sport utility trailers where the living space is not separated from the storage area will have, in most cases, a GFCI outlet provided in the kitchen sink area at a minimum. In these units, without a wall of separation, no additional GFCI outlets are required in the back of the transportation storage area. Now, a simple label clarification that falls under 55147R. As we've done for many years, when a generator prep is supplied in an RV, a junction box is also provided to make the final connection to the generator. That J box needs to be labeled as seen here on the right with the information concerning the power supply to be connected when a generator is installed. This requirement remains the same with one addition. If an automatic transfer switch is supplied as part of the generator prep package, then this location must also use the same label. Okay, 55156E. Gas piping that has bulkhead fittings, as seen here in both photographs, must have a lock washer or star washer that mechanically secures the gas manifold to the chassis and also provides the required ground continuity. If the bulkhead fitting is attached to the chassis with a bracket and fasteners, as seen on the right, lock washers or star washers must be used between the bracket and the chassis frame to ensure ground continuity and mechanical securement. All right, next is 5.2.1 and the maximum number of DOT cylinders. In light of the fact that permanently mounted ASME tanks can now have a maximum capacity of 200 gallons water capacity, the standard has increased the allowable capacity of non-permanently mounted cylinders to four 45 pound cylinders or 180 gallons water capacity. So RVs designed to accommodate four cylinders can now 
carry four 45 pound cylinders each. And remember that all other applicable requirements for securement, venting, and propane distribution still apply. Now let's look at 5.3.8.2, which is concerned with the protection of tubing and hose in the propane system as it passes through walls, floors, and partitions. Here we are just going to make a clarification. Grommets are not the only means of protecting piping as it passes through these structures. Sleeves, seen here on the left, have been used for years in the RV world. Split loom, seen here in red, is also acceptable as long as it fully covers the tubing or the hose, both at the top and the bottom edges of the hole it's passing through. Spray and foam or silicone sealants can be used for protection as well, but can be difficult to install while keeping the tubing or the hose centered in the hole while the foam or the silicone set up into a solid material. Solid loom, water lines also referred to as PEX tubing, or watertight uh, electrical conduit, all can be acceptable for protection. The concern when using these items is assuring that the tubing can be secured in position to provide the required protection. And of course, the standard grommets that are produced in a variety of styles and materials. The grommets seen here are designed to lock themselves in position as long as the holes they are protecting are the proper thickness and the hole through the structure is the proper diameter. Now, 5.3.8.6 is new to the 1192 and adds some clarity to the use of hoses in the propane system. Until now, we had little guidance on the minimum bend radius for rubber hoses, braided or not, as to what too tight a bend was in the hose. 5386 helps this a bit by referencing the hose manufacturer's requirements. Here is what we would refer to as a kink in the hose. This is when the inside radius of the hose has actually lost its round shape, a kink. This is obviously a loss of the hose's inside diameter and inherently a loss of its flow capacity. This is what the 5386 requirement is all about. So we will be inspecting hoses in the propane system and utilizing the manufacturer's specification as seen here. For hoses that are found at your manufacturing facilities that do not have specifications regarding minimum bend radius, you will be asked to provide that information from the manufacturer concerning these dimensions. The first point to remember is that we are discussing radius of the bend, not the diameter. So as seen on the chart, for example, the 3 8 diameter hose has a minimum bend radius of three inches. That is a six inch diameter. So when we look at these radius, we will envision a six inch circle as seen in the photo on the right. As you can see, a three inch radius is rather large and may be tough to maintain in certain tight spaces. Now the photo on the left is of a slide out arm supporting the propane hose. In addition, the slide-out arm has a hose support coil installed on the hose to help maintain its proper inside diameter and not restrict the flow when the slide-out is in the retracted position. Even with the coil support, it is expected that the minimum bend radius will be maintained in both the deployed and retracted positions. And finally, for clarification, the areas where we're seeing kinking of rubber hose are generally under the coach at many of the aluminum manifold blocks where multiple propane hoses are attached. Also at T connections, both under the coach and those installed vertically for hoses entering the coach. And as seen here, in any area where hose
load could be pulled too tight from the remote location in order to connect it to the other end. All right, 5A222. This simply makes the necessary changes to install this label on all RVs that need refueling. As you all know, this label was previously required on all motorhomes and truck campers. Now with the popularity of sport utility RVs that transport a wide variety of motorized vehicles, the refueling warning label will be required on all towable products that have liquid fuel storage tanks. And as usual, the label is to be installed in accordance with 5.8.2.2.2 in the appendix of the handbook on page A30. As you all know, this will detail the location of the label, the size, the color of the label, and all information on font sizes. Okay, 5.9.12. This will be a simple clarification on the test equipment being used to perform this test. The fuel distribution or dispensing system must be proven to be leak free by maintaining a minimum air pressure of 1 psi for at least 10 minutes. And the main clarification we're getting at is that the test gauge must read in not more than 1 tenth psi increments. This is the same gauge used for performing the pre-appliance gas tests on our propane systems. All right, fire extinguishers, 6.4.1. The standard now calls for the use of a listed and labeled 1A 10BC portable fire extinguisher for each RV. The extinguisher must be located as it was in the past within 24 inches of the primary exit. The primary exit will be the door used by the occupants to enter and leave the RV when in the camping mode. An additional minimum 1A 10BC fire extinguisher must be provided in the special transportation areas of RVs that contain a permanent wall of separation between the cargo area and the living area. Again, the fire extinguisher must be within 24 inches of the opening of an exterior door that serves the special transportation area. For clarification, RVs that do not have a permanent wall of separation will only be required to supply one 1A 10BC fire extinguisher that is installed within 24 inches of the primary entry exit door. Okay, on to the danger label under 6.4.6.7. Here we have a slight change in the danger label requirements. Now, based on the code language, this label must be installed inside the RV in at least one location of the transportation storage area visible when entering. Additionally, in motorized RVs with the capability of transporting internal combustion engine vehicle units, and due to the certainty that individuals will be riding on the interior of these motorized RVs, this danger label is required in both the main entry door and living space, as well as in the entry door or ramp door of the transportation area. Okay, so back to ramp doors for a second. Uh, under 6.4.10, this requirement is for switches that activate power door ramps. These switches must only be momentary switching with non-latching circuitry or equivalent. An example of this type of switch would be a spring-loaded switch that would be held in one position and returned to the off position automatically when released. This provides the safety by requiring the switch to be held on by the operator during the door ramp activation. Six point four point eleven Murphy bid installations. Wall beds, 
or Murphy beds have been introduced into the RV market for some time now. With that said, some considerations for their installation. In general, Murphy beds in an RV must be able to be safely secured in both the stored position and deployed position. Any latch or mechanism must be a positive securement that will retain the bed in both the stored and deployed positions. Here we see one example of two simple sliding bolt securements. Mechanical securements that are built into the folding mechanism are also acceptable. They also must maintain the bed in a secured stored position that will not unintentionally deploy during travel. The mechanism must also provide a secure deployed position that will not retract or unintentionally fold up when people are using the bed. So, when the bed is deployed, it must be able to maintain that position while people are located on any area of the bed. Mechanical latches or other integral mechanical securements may be employed to maintain this open position. This securement is most important when people have propped themselves up by the headboard where their weight may be behind the pivot point of the folding mechanism. Too much weight distributed to that area could inadvertently fold the bed into the stored position, trapping the people inside. So with physical securement through either manual securement with latches or with mechanical securement built into the folding mechanism, the open position must be maintained. Additionally, if the design of the Murphy bed is such that the securement latch, bolt, or other locking mechanisms are not necessary to maintain the open position, then that configuration must pass one test to be acceptable. Let's assume that the two center points seen here in red are the two pivot points for the bed to fold back into the stored position. The center line from the pivot points to the headboard needs to be tested for the amount of weight it can support before it folds back into the stored position by itself. So to test this, the area needs to be able to support 500 pounds of weight evenly distributed between the pivot point and the headboard without the foot of the bed rising off the floor. As usual, this can be documented by engineering analysis or by physical testing. A letter should be kept on file from the RV manufacturer or the bed manufacturer stating that these requirements have been met. These documents will be acceptable as proof of meeting the testing requirements when asked for by an RVIA inspector. Now, an item concerning guardrails and ladders under 6.6.3.4, which is a new section of the 1192 standard. This is a clarification that provides specific dimensions for the opening between guardrails to accommodate a ladder. Where space is provided for a ladder between the two sides of the guardrail, a maximum of 12 inches is allowable over the outside width of the ladder. Remember that guardrails must be permanent. They cannot be mounted on hinges or made easily removable. If the vertical legs of the ladder are each one inch thick, that makes the overall width of the ladder 14 inches. So the maximum width of the guardrail opening will be 26 inches. This maximum width allows the ladder to be placed anywhere within that opening. The ladder could be centered with six inches on either side. It may be placed with much more on one side as seen here with 10 inches to the left. Or eight inches to one side or the other, but still limited to a maximum opening on either side of the ladder of 12 inches or less. All right, shower stalls. Uh, this is a little bit new under 7.2.4. For some time now, the industry has incorporated tile and stone finishes in showers in the higher-end motorhomes and some fifth wheels. 
This has been allowed with a requirement that they be built using residential plumbing codes. Now, both tile, stone, and metal showers are permitted if a listed waterproof membrane extending a minimum of two inches above the top of the finished dam is used. This is also done with the understanding that they build to applicable residential plumbing codes. Now, let's look at bend radiuses for water lines under 7.3.5.8, which is another new section to the 1192 standard. When water lines are installed in any RV that are not supplied with minimum bend radiuses from the piping manufacturer, the following must be followed. These generic minimum bend radiuses are supplied to provide a guide in assuring that kinks in the water lines do not occur. Not all water lines are as rigid as PEX type tubing and bend much more easily, which can create kinks in the water line and reduced water flow. There are specific brackets provided by some tubing manufacturers that provide the proper bend radiuses for their tubing. And again, remember that we are talking about the radius, not the diameter of the bend, just as we discussed with propane piping. All right, now we'll move into an addition to the language of 7.3.12.4 and the use of pressure relief valves. First, as we all know, propane water heaters must be listed for RV use and must have a relief valve installed along with the proper means of drainage. These valves are typically referred to as temperature and pressure valves or T&P valves. This is a typical T&P seen throughout the industry. Other types of T&P valves are now being introduced that are not directly connected to the tank. In most cases, these are found on hydronic heating systems that both heat the interior living space of an RV as well as heating the potable water. In the event that the relief valve is separate from the tank, first be sure to follow the manufacturer's installation instructions for the pressure relief valve. Then, the installation must be done in such a way that no other valves can be located between the relief valve and the tank. Now when electric water heaters are installed within the RV, they will need to have their relief valve drains discharged to the exterior and comply with all other provisions of this requirement. This includes the use of a drain pipe from the TNP valve outlet that does not diminish in size and that has the end of the drain pipe directed downward and outside the RV with a method employed to prevent capping or plugging of the discharge end. So the main takeaway from 7.3.12.4 is the need for a T&P valve on all hydronic heating equipment including the standard water heaters. Okay. 7472. A couple of reminders or clarifications concerning side vented systems. First, only one fixture can be vented through the side vented system. The side vented system is only permitted to be used with liquid waste holding tanks. Any holding tank with a toilet attached cannot be used on a side vented system. The trap used on a side vented drainage system cannot be less than an inch and a quarter in diameter and must meet all the other requirements shown in this illustration. When a side vented drainage system is fabricated, only listed components may be used and with a DWV rating. And finally, a baffle or diverter T, as seen here on the right, needs to be installed where the trap arm of the fixture connects to the side vented drainage system. Now for one more clarification on flexible drain systems. 
A flexible drain system needs to be a listed assembly. A flexible drain system is limited to one single compartment sink or shower and are not to be connected to a permanently installed holding tank. And finally, a flexible drain system cannot be used on a tub drain. Now, let's move to a change in regards to the black water or body waste holding tanks. Under 7.5.3.8, an additional valve will be required to prevent wastewater from backfilling into fixtures. This situation comes into play when a plumbing system with fixtures at different floor elevations force a fixture drain to be lower than the flood level of the toilet as seen here. For example, this can be seen in many travel trailers with exterior kitchens. The sink in many of those outdoor kitchens will drain into the black water holding tank because it is the closest and or the only accessible holding tank for that fixture. This causes the fixture drain to be positioned very low on the plumbing system and in many cases below the flood level of the toilet as illustrated here. Mechanical seal toilets are the only option when connected to a holding tank. Flush toilets are again not allowed. If the black water holding tank were to become overfilled because of the mechanical seal toilet, it could potentially flow up into the fixture drain and eventually pass the P-trap and into the sink itself. So the use of backwater valves is required if this plumbing configuration is used. Here we see two typical backwater valves used in RVs. They are generally manufactured in both one and a half inch and two inch sizes. Here is a cutaway of a backwater valve similar in design to the one and a half and two inch models we would utilize in RVs. You can see here that the flapper valve is hinged on the upstream side of the valve. Water can only flow through the flapper valve in one direction because the flapper valve is hinged to only open in the correct direction of flow. Water backing up through a holding tank would be blocked at this point as the flapper would be forced shut by water flowing in the wrong direction. So, as seen here, the backwater valve would be installed in the fixture drain to stop an overfilled holding tank from entering the fixture trap and the fixture itself. So again, with the backwater valve installed as seen here in the trap arm of the fixture, backfilling water and solids would be stopped. Additionally, if any solids were deposited in the horizontal section of the trap arm, when water from the fixture, the tub or the shower in this case, were to flow again, it will flush those solids back into the holding tank. Where an exterior ladder is provided to the roof of a recreational vehicle, it must comply and be installed in accordance with ANSI RVIA XTLAD 1. The recommended practices laboratory test procedure for exterior ladder on a recreational vehicle. If an exterior ladder is provided to the roof of a recreational vehicle, the ladder, each individual rung, and all attached components shall be able to support the weight of three times the maximum rated capacity of the ladder. A caution label shall be affixed in a visible location adjacent to the exterior ladder. The caution label shall comply with all of the following. The label shall be printed with the word caution a minimum of one quarter inch high. The body text shall be a minimum of one eighth inch high. The body text shall be printed on a contrasting background. And the label shall read as shown in figure 8.8.1.3. All right, axles and wheels, 8.6.2.
This requirement in this section only applies to towable RVs. First, tire and wheel assemblies must be installed according to ANSI TSIC 1, recommended practices. The requirement for tires to be rated at 110% or 106% of the gross axle weight rating has been in force now for some time, but here's a quick review. First, with axles rated at 8,000 pounds or less. So say you have an axle with a gross axle weight rating found on the CFR 49 label that is 3,500 pounds. 110% times 3,500 equals 3,850. Therefore, you need two tires rated at 1,925 pounds for each tire. That equals a gross axle rating of 3,850. Now let's look at axles over 8,000 pounds. The sum of the maximum load ratings of all tires on a given axle rated more than 8,000 pounds must not be less than 106% of the gross axle weight rating of that specific axle. So here the GAWR for the axle is specified on its CFR 49 label as 9,000 pounds. So 9,000 pounds times 106% equals 9,540 pounds. Therefore, you need two tires rated at a minimum of 4770 pounds each. Two times 4770 equals 9,540 pounds. And finally, these same requirements apply to all spare tires as well and again are based on the gross axle weight ratings. So that's it. Thanks for reviewing the code changes for the 2021 edition of the ANSI 1192 RV standard. Please feel free to contact RVIA with any questions concerning this information or any other code related items. My email address is listed here and I will respond to your questions as soon as possible. And again, thanks for being part of the RV Industry Association.